The final two events are trajectory and detector building. And these are standard high school level projects, but they have solid learning opportunities baked into them. And there are plenty of connections you can make between your courses in physics and computer science, maybe even statistics if you take it to these two events. So for those of you who want to supplement and enrich your academic knowledge and get a glimpse into some real world engineering problems that you are mature enough to solve after taking these classes, these events are for you. So these events are useful and they're quite fun. So let's get right in. The first one on the list is trajectory, which is essentially a catapult. You have to build a catapult and that launches the device into a target. This target will be, as with gravity vehicle, nobody knows when, where the target will be before they get to the competition. All you know, it's going to be between two to eight meters away from the launch point. And you need to have some sort of way to calibrate your launcher to make sure that the trajectile lands where you expect it to. And this picture here uh, is actually a launcher I built for one of my classes. And we will come back to this uh, at the end when I ask you a question. But yeah, I hope you can appreciate how good or maybe trashy this looks. Yeah, anyways, let's move on. The launch zone will look something like I drew in this schematic. Looking from the top, it will be in a high school gym and you'll have a one by one and a half square meter zone in which you can put your launcher. And from this launcher, there will be a center line and there will be two targets near the center line. The near target, the one that's closer to you, and the far target, which is further away. Now, what's special about these two targets is that the near target, if we look at it on this picture, which is the side view, can be elevated up to two meters. And the, the, the far target will have to remain flat on the ground, but it can be moved up to two meters away from the center line. So you'll have to aim it sideways, have to shoot it to the side. And it's not going to be at a predefined location it's going to be at a certain point between two and eight meters away from the launch zone. And that distance can be defined either in one meter intervals at regionals. So the event supervisor can say, launch it to three meters and you have to launch it to three meters. At states, they'll give you uh, the intervals go up to, or go down to 50 centimeters. And at nationals, it goes down to 10 centimeters. So as with gravity vehicle, you need to have a way to make sure that you can control where your projectile falls to the nearest 10 centimeters or less. Because remember, at gravity vehicle, the stopping point was less than the interval. And here, you'll probably have teams hitting bullseye. So this is really whose device can run most consistently and most precisely, most accurately. And let's look at how perhaps a how a couple let's look at a couple of students trying to perform this or test their launcher at the competition with this video it's not an official science olympiad video
so noticed a few things here. Their first launch was quite unsuccessful. Notice how it landed somewhere. It landed on the blue, on the on the white kind of trash bag around the target, like all the way over here. That's way off. But that's what what happened there is because when they pulled on their trigger mechanism. So right here, when they pulled on it, notice their um, their entire catapult jerks a little bit to the side, like like that, and that made the projectile also go to the side. However, the beauty here is that on their second attempt, they adapted and they realized that if it's going too far to the left, well, then we need to tilt it a bit to the right more so that the next time it will go just right. And that's exactly what they did. So in the next one, they tilted this, the device kind of, well, let's see. Yeah, they see how it's tilted very off to the side. And that's really, that's the adaptation and the fighting spirit that I wanted to show. So if something doesn't go to plan, the, the idea is, is that you've tested your device so much, you're so familiar with it, is that you know what happened and you can figure out and adapt. And that's also a recurring theme from Gravity Vehicle. Now, I did say that there are some course connections with physics. The area of physics that deals with projectiles and catapults is called kinematics. And this deals with things like the equation of motion and Newton's laws. So the equations of motion can tell us how far an object will fly if you determine its height, its velocity, its angle, like stuff like this. So similarly, like with your catapult, you're launching the projectile at a certain height, at a certain velocity, and at a certain angle. Like it could be either very high up or kind of near horizontal. And you can, there are formulas that will tell you how long of a distance it will travel. And these formulas have been uh, derived by Newton centuries ago. So they really stem from Newton's laws of motion. And this in particular is just a special case for when you have gravity acting downwards. And when you have gravity acting down, you have a parabolic arc like this. However, th this also touches upon aspects of energy. So the catapult is kind of like a slingshot. You put the projectile in, you pull the rubber bands back, and you release it. So when you pull the rubber bands back, you're storing the energy into the rubber band. And then when you release it, the stored potential energy, the elastic energy, will be transferred into the energy of motion, which is called kinetic energy. And so we need to know basically what's how big of a rubber band or how strong or tight of a rubber band to choose. And that's why we need to talk about energy and mechanical work. And that way you would have a solid understanding that to make it travel this far a distance, I'll have to pull the spring back this much, thereby the projectile will travel at this velocity and everything will be fine. However, it's not always fine because there's friction. When the ball travels through the air, there is air molecules pushing back against it. The collision with the air molecules makes it lose some of its uh, energy of velocity in the forward direction. And we can't neg neglect it. If we do a calculation and forget about friction, our results will, the, one, the distance that we'll have in real life will actually be bigger than or smaller, sorry, than what we predicted. So it will always be an undershoot. That's not good. And so we have to talk about friction and how we can uh, account for air drag to correct for the distance. And I guess another comment here. So this is really a mechanical system. This, this topic is kind of about mechanics, no electronics, no computer science, just mechanics. And several things that I wanted to emphasize was that you need to design a good trigger mechanism, a trigger mechanism that doesn't jerk the catapult when you pull on it. And so it's a hard question. How do we safely release a large force by applying a small one? And it's kind of well thought out in a gun right here. So we have a gun and 
you push here at the trigger and there's a system of levers, there's a spring to make sure you feel a little bit of resistance. And finally, this part right here, when you pull on the trigger, this part goes down and it releases a very, very large force over a very small distance. And making sure that this trigger mechanism works smoothly and it locks and it doesn't release accidentally if you just accidentally shake it is very important in engineering. Just as important as making sure that your catapult won't snap because the springs are too big. So you need to make sure that the pieces of wood or metal that you use to build it are strong enough to withhold the pulling force of the springs. Which brings us to the next point. We need to know what springs to get. We can't just, so we need to make a calculation to kind of understand in what ballpark of spring we need. But then the real challenge is finding a commercially available product that's nearest to it. So we can't afford to have a custom built spring delivered to our door. We have to buy something similar or the nearest match. And engineers spend a lot of time uh, of their working hours looking for these commercially available parts. Finally, you need to have some sort of aiming device. It needs to be easy for humans to use because making something easy to use reduces mistakes. If you have something complicated, something hard to set up, chances are you'll mess it up on the competition because you're nervous. So that's why we want you to build something called an aiming device. A very simple one here is on a gun. Yes, catapults are kind of like guns. Uh, I guess I didn't realize that. So you, the way you aim the barrel so that the bullet goes in the right direction is that you make sure that this front sight, the stick, is perfectly aligned with the rear sight when you look through it. So when you look through, you need to see the stick right between in that little gap here. And that way you know that you're, you're aiming straight. So these types of things are, basically we need to build a good mechanism, nothing fancy, no electronics, it needs to work well. And the area of engineering and science that deals with this is called mechanical engineering.